Um, I quite am all to, to speak to all of you. I know in which footsteps I'm setting my feet in, but I'm delighted and Angela, thank you for reaching out to us and you gave us food for thought because it's one thing to garden. It's a pleasure thing for us, a kind of a love affair, but it's another thing to share it, to think about what we did for many years already and what we are planning to do for the rest of our lives. So welcome to our Giardino di Hera. It is an irrigation free garden um, for a very simple reason. We don't live there on a regular basis and any system we would install would be rocked overnight. But this is only a practical reason. More important, it is free, irrigation free on purpose because we want to grow our garden in harmony with nature and the surrounding landscape as we see it. And the annual rainfall <clears throat> isn't so low, it's 620 millimeters average, but most of it fell, uh, uh, falls in, 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 in the early spring. I looked up the weather forecast, I'm talking to you from Munich right now, it's a gray and rainy cold day, and the weather forecast for Giungano tomorrow is sun, 15, 17, 18 degrees, for the next week to come. So please come with me. This is Gondola. You will meet her later, at least her voice. As Angela said, she can't be with us tonight because she's giving concert with her students. And there she's taking pictures for her Instagram account, which some of you might know. And that's her way to reach out to the kind of <clears throat> other gardeners we like, we, uh, we get inspired from. No, no audio. Uh, okay. So, as I was saying, you can see Gundula taking pictures for her Instagram, which some of you might know. That at least was the way Angela discovered us, and I'm very happy about it. And this is me. And now, please meet Gundula. I'm Gunilla Anders, and I would like to welcome you all. Unfortunately, I can't be here today in person because I'm giving a concert with my students in Leipzig. But I would like to tell you a little about our Giardino di Era. We have dedicated our garden to Hera as a link to nearby ancient Pastum, where she was worshipped in several temples, and her cult lived on even after the city has been finally abandoned in the 10th century. Hera was the goddess of the earth and its inhabitants, especially women. She was the mistress of the most beautiful gardens, and it was not by chance that one of her invocations was that of Antaya, the goddess of flowers. All her invocations underline her role in the world of nature, of growth, of the fertility of nature and of people. Hera's sacred animal was the cow. She was also called the cow-eyed one, which was a special compliment to her beautiful eyes. Many of her sanctuaries, including the Herion at the mouth of the river Seine in Pestum, are located in fertile plains crossed by a river, which were good grazing land for cattle and horses. Today's buffaloes in the plain of Pestum are reminiscent of the ancient herds of cattle. Hera's attributes included the pomegranate as a sign of fertility. The gardens of Hera that surrounded her shrines were a combination of natural and cultivated nature, where the sacred animals roamed freely and the plants flourished under the protection of the goddess. Seeds from ancient times of myrtles, crocus, iris, and daffodils were found in the surroundings of the Herion in Pestum. The valley of our town, Jungano, is a cultivated landscape characterized by olive growing and viticulture. On the steeper slopes, the land has been terraced for this purpose, as is the case in the upper section of the valley where our garden is located, and we call over 100 old olive trees our own. The Via Madonna di Loreto, which runs through the valley past our property, is an ancient trade and pilgrimage route. The terracing of the terrain is fortified with old, still visible dry stone walls. 
Along the path grow oak trees several hundred years old. Possibly this road connected Pestum and Velia in ancient times. The terrace terrain of our garden is only partially preserved, but its archaic layout could have been similar in antiquity. Behind the property, the mountains rise and close off the garden to the north. To the west, the view opens onto the sea with a view of Capri and the Amalfi coast. In parts of the garden, all plantings mimic the Mediterranean macchia and garig. Others are deliberately left untouched by intervention so that nature can unfold with wild flowers and natural shrubs. All aspects of a garden described since Homer are found in our Giardino di Era. The kepos, the walled formal garden with fruit trees, roses and other flowers, which is contrasted with the alsos, the grove with old oaks. These groves were sacred places because of the deities that were worshipped in such as Artemis or Apollo. The idea of the garden as described in ancient literature paints a picture of a happy place where smells, flowers and herbs celebrate life, but also show the responsibility of humans to control, order and regulate nature. Yet even this ability is a gift from the gods. The garden is thus a metaphor for a place where human and natural fertility flourish thanks to the protection of a deity. Almost all the plants that grow on our property have been known since ancient times, and about most of them there are stories and myths. The word kepos was also used to describe the garden school of Epicurus, who lived 341 to 270 BC in Athens. In the small garden plot, the Kepidion, which he acquired in 306, Epicurus friends and followers, including women and slaves, gathered to live and work together according to Epicurus' philosophical and practical principles. The inscription at the entrance to the garden read, friend, this is a good place. Here the joy of life is the highest good. Also, our garden is meant to be a place to celebrate the joy of life, to find peace of mind, to nurture and cultivate plants and friendships. The garden is bathed in sunlight from morning to evening. The old olive trees and the oaks provide shade. Water is available in the form of a well. A breeze blows through it, coming from the sea in summer. But sometimes, especially in winter, fierce northeasterly Tramontana winds sweep down from the mountains to the sea. Then the air is clean and clear. The wind the blows is up here. out to the sea, which shines dark blue in the distance. At some times of the year, the sun sets directly behind Capri. Start video. Well. I guess I was too fast. Thank you, Gundula. Well, long story short, <clears throat> where's mine? We began gardening in Munich. Stop. The, the video is the house we live in. Peter, sorry, I've had to mute you as well. Sorry, because somebody's talking. Okay. So. Well, not to lose too much time, this is where we started to garden in Munich. It's a very small plot in front of our house. And well, and then we saw looking for a garden in the south of Italy to be able to garden also in the winter. And since I spent part of the year working there as a tour guide and travel author, it's there we looked for a piece of land. And after many research trips, we found it in the Chilean video. Company. I don't need more by chance. Mute, no. The 106. Well, Angela, they're still talking. I, I just go ahead, right? So I'm the only one. No, these people. Um, yeah. Angela, do you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you, Peter. Okay, I am unmuted. <laughs> okay, I think this will take a little bit longer then. Yeah, because people are coming in a bit late, that's all. Okay, that's Sorry, all right. You, uh, thanks for your patience and thanks for your, you know, I know it's obviously no. disturbing. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> um, hello, everyone. I'm, I gather we are even more now, and I was bringing you to where our garden lies. We were looking for it in the south of Italy. In the end, we found it in the region of Campania. <clears throat> this is the Gulf of Naples. You all have to get out of here. You no, might know. I have to <laughs> exit full screen. No. No. Can and do what with the settings? Um, OK, I wait until they have. I've, got, I've, I've muted them again. So please start, you know, I'm sorry about this, uh, Peter. Caroline Hall, sorry, you're interrupting the speech. If you could just mute yourself while you're trying to work out your technical details. Thank you, that would be great. Okay, <clears throat> we are used to chaos. I'm working in Naples very often and there it is. <clears throat> and this is the big island of Ischia and many of you will know Capri maybe um i don't know how i could i was able to get a laser pointer yeah that's much better so i'll get back so this is capri <clears throat> and the sorrento peninsula and the amalfi coast and here opens another gulf much bigger not so well known and this is the gulf of salerno where we are you can see the walled in city of ancient Pestum. In antiquity, it was right on the sea. And in the 10th century, it was abandoned by its population for many reasons. And they fled into the hinterland and found new settlements, among others, Giungano. And it's there I want to bring you. You heard Gondula <clears throat> telling you about the old road, the Via Madonna di Loreto, and it runs right in the middle through our land. There's this upper part where our house stands, which is terraced, and the lower part is sloping down. The overall size of our property is three hectares or seven and a half acres. And most of our garden interventions take place in the upper part, but all the surrounding landscape is visually part of our Jadiro de Hera and that's what we were looking for. So it is fair to say that we have a lot of borrowed landscape to call our own. On the lower property, where a neighbor may stay for his buffalo, stand our best olive trees, because we do make one. Giungano. Sorry, Peter. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry to stop you again. Miles. Can you please mute yourself? You're causing echo. Miles Halford. I, I can't see anything. Oh, oh, we did it. No? Yes? Better. Thank you. Miles, great. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is Trungano. Here about is our garden. On a higher plateau, you can see Trentinara. And both towns go back to the early Middle Age but preserve ancient roots. And according to legend, it's here at the entrance of this gorge, Spartacus fought his last battle. In town, there are still a lot of small holders like Luigi Lotti, which is a very common name in town. Maria here grows her own vegetables and sells them in her grocery store. This is our friend Luigi Lotti, another one with this common name works as a bus driver and coach operator. He's a part-time farmer and helps us out occasionally. The Cilento is famous for its white figs. They are sun-dried and filled with almonds and lemon peel. Quite a delicacy. And this is our friend Pierino Builder, and he has renovated our house. Francesca harvesting her figs, and I showed her because at her place my donkeys live. In Jungan and in the neighboring villages, there still are a lot of sheep and goat farmers who send their flocks to pasture. 
And even before COVID, a young generation started to turn back to agriculture, which I consider a very encouraging development. The same, if you remember, happened in Greece during the financial crisis. And he wrote, in go to we trust on his t-shirt. In Giungano, apart from two highly professional run wineries, there are numerous private vineyards. And when he's not harvesting grapes, Michele Lotti, together with his father, Pierino, whom you met already, trying to fix, um, runs a building company. This is an our ground. We have a visit from my good friend, Bruno de Concilis. He is one of the winemakers in the Chilean term and is quite taken by our garden. And last year, he tried to convince us to plant a vineyard too. And we were tempted, but in the end renounced. Not living there all year long, it seemed impossible to us to keep up with the work. And I can assure you, olives are much less demanding. So at first, <clears throat> I would like to give you a short overview of where we are. This is Capaccio Vecchio. It's the first place to which the population of Paestum fled in the 10th century, because the plain was getting wet and there were persistent attacks of pirates. And from up here, also from our garden, it's a similar view, you can see the Gulf of Naples with the Monti Latari. They are the backbone of the Amalfi Coast, the Sorrento Peninsula, and these are the same mountains, even so it's an island now. This is Capri. Pestum, seen from the other side, from the plain, with the ancient walls. And those are the mountains in the background. And here we can't see directly is our garden. Pestum is famous for its perfectly preserved Greek temples. And in Roman times, it was preceded by the reputation of its roses, Pliny mentions them, for example. Whether they were twice blooming or not is still open to debate. Their petals were used in huge quantities to produce a rose scented oil. And a couple of years ago, historic roses were planted in the archaeological area. Unfortunately, the groundkeepers treat them like modern roses and cut them back every year. During excavations in the 60s, 200 richly painted tombs were uncovered. Most famous is this tomb of the diver, so far the only example of classical Greek wall painting. Other tombs from the Lucanians, former Greek mercenaries, and then they took over, they back to the fourth century BC. They depict burial scenes, gladiatorial fights or hunting scenes. And I must admit, I'm not sad to see this wild boar in pain because we have a huge problem with them and are not the only ones. On many frescoes, pomegranates appear, both as symbols for death and fertility. In Pestum, the pomegranate is the attribute of the goddess Hera and her cult still lives on in nearby Capaccio. Here, the Madonna del Granato is worshipped. And you can see in her right hand, she holds a pomegranate fruit. <clears throat> now, without losing too much time, I want to show you some of the nearby sites and landscapes we draw inspiration from. This is Pompeii, with restored vineyards on their original site. And the new director, Gabriel Zuchtriegel, is about to enhance the entire agriculture area of the archaeological park. Ultimately, he had lawn mowers and trimmers replaced with a flock of sheep. A pleasure garden in Pompeii in the house of Octavius Quartzio. And archaeologists have been able to identify many of the plants thanks to remains like the casts of roots. And also frescoes were helpful in the reconstruction of the gardens. On this painting from the House of the Golden Bracelet, you can see Platanus Orientalis in the middle, the Burnuntinus, the Oleander, this is Arbutus Onedo, and roses, of course. From afar, 
We look at the Amalfi Coast, which is a massive terrace landscape, and as such a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The reputation of its gardens precede the Amalfi Coast. The most famous of all is the Villa Cimbruna in Ravello. Bronze statues, like the one you see here, are faithful copies of antique originals from Herculaneum. The Terrace of Infinity faces to the coast of Pestum. Only our Giardino di Hera is too small to be seen from this distance. For our pergola in Giungano, we opted for a white wisteria. This is a very famous wisteria walk in the Villa Cimbrone. But <clears throat> more than <clears throat> the famous gardens, and there are many more on the coast, it is the rural natural landscape which inspired us because we find it much more in accordance with our idea of Mediterranean gardening. It's here we look out for plant combinations, for color, texture, foliage, and flowering seasons, and the interplay between rocks and plants, some of which we try to recreate in our garden, like this combination of tree spurge and valerian. Or, Another example, now from Capri, tree spurge with Cistus creticus. On Capri, we found some very fine examples of natural gravel gardens. Again, I've heard about Androides, Rosemary, and Urginea, today it's called Drimia Maritima. This is a classic garden without a gardener. Please meet the mother plants of hundreds of Shilla Peruviana specimens within our garden. I had it as a present from a man in Capri, and it grows also in the wild. This is another perfect match, Triophorbia and Rosemary. On the west coast of Capri, you'll find extraordinary specimens of Antilles parvaiovis, Jove's bird, beard. We bought two plants from Olivier Philippi, and in the beginning they seemed to adapt well, but in the end both died, maybe due to the low air humidity in summer, because we're not so close to the sea. We'd be much more lucky with Convolvulus cneorum, the silver convolvulus, which Gundula propagates successfully by cuttings, and they also self-seed in our garden. So this is a view from the highest mountain of Capri back to the Cilento coast, which you see here in the mist. And in spring, there's abundance of flowering Asphodelus ramosus, another plant we introduced in our garden. The Giardino di Hera is located in the Cilento National Park, which is the second biggest in Italy. And this is just one example of view from the south of you from Capo Palinuro. And Euphorbia and Druides cross prominently in limestone. Gundula here is hiking along the mountain ridge above Giungano, and the lentisks are sculpted by wind and sheep, a good example for what we do in our garden, which is also a limestone backdrop, which means good drainage and the vegetation is very rich in species. Pasquale. And this family, for many years, were the groundkeepers. And it was his goal to keep the bushes in check. And once we bought the land, we asked him kindly, but to send his goats <clears throat> on the upper part to graze, because they wanted to realize our garden. And they are still welcome on the lower part. And this, that's how we found our future Jardim Vihera 17 years ago. The house was abandoned, the roof fortunately not too damaged, and in front of the house was this abandoned orange garden, surrounded by dry stone walls. The ground used to be plowed, otherwise the whole terrain would have been overgrown with brambles and oaks. And here Gundula is sitting on the rock and dreaming about, future, about our future garden. From when we laid eyes on it for the first time, it took us three years before we could finally purchase the ground. These three big boulders and the three olives in line are a happy accident. 
we couldn't have made it better. So <clears throat> to give you an example of our approach to gardening, which it rarely include a planting scheme or planning, I would like to show you one of the borders and how it developed over time. That's how we found it. The old wall had probably collapsed and the remains were leveled to make way for the tractor. This was in April, 2008. <clears throat> Two years later, with the help of professional stonemasons, we had the wall rebuilt and on the occasion installed a staircase that had not existed before. We reused the old stones for construction backfilling. In German, there's a saying, when you're filthy rich, you are stone rich. We are filthy rich, at least in matter of stones. It then took us a while to decide for a layout. In the end, we cut down most of the lentils to the roots, where boulders were too big to be moved by me, because later we don't, didn't have any machinery. We worked and still work by hand. I only adjusted them and added new ones or concentrated stones at some places and built stairs or I set stepping stones. In the beginning, we were using, for this board at least, mostly plants from Olivier Philippi and some lavenders grown from cuttings. And that's how it looked a year later. And also the two Antilles I mentioned before seem well established. But after a very dry winter, the first had died and the second followed. Generally, we tried to plant in autumn and water the new plants over the first year. But since we don't live in Jungana all the time, some plants may die during longer periods of drought. So now I would like to show you this border over the course of the year. And snowfall is a very rare, a very rare occurrence. It only happens now and then and the snow never lasts long. In February, Euphorbia rigida, rosemary, and lavandula dentata dominate. In the foreground, you can see the shape is lentiscus. And <clears throat> this was the first time we had done it, and we were very, very pleased to see how well these plants regrew. And from now on, we took over from the goats. Leaves of Urginea or Drinia Maritima and uh, Matula Incana. Iris albicans, Euphorbia segetalis, which is wild and self seeding. And this is one of the first sisters to flower. And on the wall, Rose Magnus prostratus continues to flower. They started in October already. And Mediterranean hardwood, Tordillium apulum, is flowering in abundance. And it mingles well with the planted species in our border. And since we don't know our meadows until summer, there's a smooth transition between planted borders and wilder parts of the garden. And this is the Tordillium. I showed you before. This echium survives our winter as well. It is protected by a dry stone wall. Other attempts where we planted them in the open were less successful. They died. In May, the plants from the very colorful tapestry, the foreground from Orientalis, Erigeron, and Moltkia Petrea. Again, the self seeded Euphorbia cigitalis, Achillea nobilis, Centauria cineraria, and the back Citrantus rube, the white variety. We, were, we have been warned about Achillea nobilis. It really is invasive. This is a local allium, Allium commutatum, and a Salvia pomifera. In the beginning, it did better, the Onotera or Gaura Lintaimeri. And in the last year, it just barely survives because the summer gets 
ever more drier and longer. For a salvia cleaf landy copes much better with our condition and has beautiful seeds late in the year. Lots of scabious varieties from natural and meadows, and they are welcome in the borders as well. And here in the midst, you can make out uh, Caperis spinosa. Over the years, I brought many capable plants from the Orient Islands, and the few who survive now thrive, and we even started to harvest our own capers. They grow wild along the Amalfi coast on Capri and in the Cilento too. The Parina hirta, this is the most prominent of our natural grasses. We sometimes cut some plants that glow and enjoy its inflorescence when it's lit up in this reddish golden light. On the other hand, we introduced Penisetum macrourum with success, and you can see that it expands. This is the Centaurio cineraria. Now in summer, it has these star shaped seed heads. Citrantus ruber reflowers after the first rains in September. Here, they self seeded and come out also of the dry stone walls. And while the last of the Salvia Yangi, the Perovskia, is flowering, rosemary starts again. When <clears throat> we discovered this piece of land and then started gardening even before our house was finished, we were and we still are very happy about the numerous Pistacia lentiscus bushes on our property. The lentisks, they have spread in the years when the olive grove was abandoned and they make a beautiful backdrop. We let let them grow as trees and bushes. Some are pruned, others are cut to the ground and shaped anew. You've seen an example before, and you will see others. Their elegant leaves expose in the heat of the summer an amazing green, and also the fruits and the flowers are very decorative. Cistus criticus is the main cistus species that grows naturally on our ground. And we encourage it by freeing it from competing plants. This is a natural combination of Cistus criticus and Bituminaria bituminosa, the pitch trefoil. There was a time I brought seeds from Sicily because I liked the plant and then Gundra showed me that we already had almost too many of them. This is Armachia border in May. We introduced Cistus monspeiensis, but later on also found small specimens already present, and we encourage self-seeding. Same border, the other direction. Cistus albidus introduced as a tiny seedling from the Provence, and there is Cistus purpureus in the corner. Some close-ups. This is the last one <clears throat> I was telling about. It's Cistus purpureus. And this is a Cistus purpureus, Alan Fred, a wide variety. Over the years, we introduced many different varieties of rosemary. And here's the combination you've seen on Capri some minutes ago. And wherever we travel, we collect cuttings. Here on top of the wall, we have three different varieties of prostrate rosemary. And they all started out as very, very small cuttings. In the foreground, Lavandra detata, which flowers almost all year round, save July and August. This rosemary was a very blue, intense blue flowers we found on the roadside. Savia fruticosa is one of the many species of savia we planted, and we have also local species which grow higher up in the mountains naturally. <clears throat> this is also true for Lavandula angustifolia. These are plants we bought. You can find them in the highest altitudes in the Cilento. 
and in our garden it's barely tolerating the conditions it's too hot for it to dry but we are very fond of this combination with the flowering pomegranates our reverence to the goddess Hera. It took us a while to establish Chitrantos Rube, but now it self seeds free with the white and the pink variety. Thanks to their striking colors, Euphorbias play an important role in our garden. But apart from Euphorbia segetalis, we introduced all other species. On the steepy rock faces about our property, graced by goats, we can make out huge specimens of Euphorbia and Reedus in the distance. And this plant, you can see in the picture, is one of the several we planted as very small seedlings. A combination of Euphorbia rigida and rosemary in the main border. Another border was Euphorbia rigida, Euphorbia myrzinitis, and Euphorbia caracias. Tree spurge, Convolvulus cneorum and uh, Vituminaria bituminosa. This is the variety of Caracas, which is brown spot, which is very widespread in the Chilento. It's a very tough and resistant plant and farewells also in periods of drought and it's suitable for any location. This is a subspecies Wolfenii, which many of you might know, and we bought it and added it to the others. Again, I forbid Androides, Convolvulus, Cneorum. It's also a combination we often saw in nature. And this is the wild Salvia officinalis in the back here. <clears throat> As I told you on Capri, we introduced Asphodilus ramosus and other asphodels, like Fistolosus, for example. As our property never was a grazing ground for cattle, where Asphodelus is a common pasture wheat, it was not present before, but it grows perfectly well. Another example how we combine the euphorbias, and this you've seen on Capri, tree spurge and valerian. The seed heads of Caracas. In the beginning, we cared for a neater appearance of our garden and were fast to cut. But in the meantime, we came to appreciate the seed heads of many plants and let them stand. So the garden becomes much, much more and more wilder. Roses. It's a delicate chapter. <clears throat> the proximity of our garden to Pestum inspired us to plant roses and dedicate the garden to Hera. Our Rosa Quinensis, the Vesuv, does quite well. And in the beginning, Gundula chose historical roses like Rosa Alba, Rosa Officinalis, or Catle Saison, the presumed descent of the famous Rosa Vifera from Pestum. And even though we planted them in deep and rich soil, most of them were not very happy and many died. And we were more successful with Rosa Quinensis. Here is a Rosa Mutabilis. Same flower, one day apart, hence the name Rosa Mutabilis. Some modern roses like Rosa Polbocus from Del Bar do very well. But it's because it's growing in our orange garden and gets watered from time to time. It's one of the rare exceptions. Our native Rosa Sempervirens, and it is very vigorous. Again, some close ups. This would be the Rosa Bifera or Rosa Damascena Catricezon assumed pestum rose. The first garden of my childhood was a pot garden on the terrace of my grandmother. And there I cultivated two plants, irises and dagitis. And I'm very still fond of irises. And we collect all kinds of them. 
The first flower is Iris unguicular, starting November, and flowers until early spring. And we got this clump from our dear friends, Don Leavers and Lindsay McGarity. They also live in the Chilento and are very generous with their plants and also with their judgment. Here is Psora Pumila from the Gargano in Puglia. You can find blue and white iris barbata in many cotton gardens all over Italy. They were also used to stabilize slopes along roadside, and therefore they often run wild. Here is albicans. It's been cultivated since ancient times, and it may be the oldest iris in cultivation. I only recently learned that it's considered a fire retardant plant, so maybe we should give it more space. Some other examples. It is pallida, flowering in May. And again, some close up. Our collection, for example, includes also Iris japonica, which does well in the shade. This is the wild Iris tuberosa, grows in our meadows and in the woods Iris fetidissima. Also the seeds are particularly beautiful. Upper left burnt toffee from Cayeux. This is another gift from our friends from Don Lever. In this case, a breed called Ginger Boys. It's an offspring of gingerbread men. And this is one from Gundra's mother's garden in Germany, a Lorelei, or a very nice combination we like of volts and time. As to the bulbs, you've seen the mother plant of our Shila Peruvianas and Capri, and now we have hundreds in our place. In the wild, they grow on rocky ground, and as for many plants, we try to create to give them a similar habitat. It is tuberosa, which some of you still might know as Hermodactylus tuberosus, and you can find them on roadsides in the Chilento. Narcissus, Jonquilla Martinet, was a nice scent. And this is a natural combination of Muscari comosum and Tordulium apulum, and we encourage it by planting more Muscari bulbs. And you can buy them in the local supermarket because Italians do like to eat them. Alas, this is a picture of the past because the wild boars greatly diminished our Gladiolus italicus stocks. It was nice to discover that Legium candidum was already present in our garden when we bought it. Dremia maritima put some quite a show in late August after the first rains, very widespread in southern Italy and often found in rocky coastal areas. The fragrant flowers of Narcissus erotinus appear in October. Again, some close-ups. Paper white, Narcissus tazetta, one of the local allium species, allium neapolitanum, Shila Peruviana, you've seen often already. And these are just two of the species of orchideas we have, the Orchis Italicus and Serapia Vomeracea. They got a little bit diminished too, because it seems the wild boars, they like their bulbs. Another wild allium, this is Allium nigrum. It occurs in our more loamy soils on the lower part, we brought up some bulbs, that's well. Also present on the grounds naturally, Allium cumtatum. Lilies are difficult, they're not too happy and usually they don't come back after we put them into the earth. Agapanthus in our orange garden. This is a wild plant, it grows on the dunes of Pestum, well, on all the dunes in the Mediterranean and sometimes in winter, after heavy storms, we rescue some of the bulbs and plant them into our garden. 
with many cyclamen hedrifolium, they grow all over the place and they tolerate shade and root competition well. Now to the meadows. They look like lace in April. This again is Stordulium apulum, the Mediterranean hardwood. We model the meadows as late as possible to encourage insect life, also to keep our olive trees healthy. And by the way, we never use pesticides to fight the fruit fly. On the other hand, we have to take into account the risk of fires. Therefore, we mow everything in summer and have the hay removed. It's fodder for my donkeys. Crepes rubra. The many varieties of scabious attract all kinds of moth and butterflies. And apart from them, Daucus carota is among the few summer flowering plants. And as you can see, the Parina hirpa is very attractive all summer too. We always leave some of the plants and here in the background you see the main border I showed you in the beginning. Half a century ago, our garden used to be a working farm where olive trees and fig trees were cultivated. None of the fig trees survived. We planted new ones. But we call 100 olive trees our own. And some of them might be 200 years old. <clears throat> Andrea, I never answered your question whether we would plant decorative plants beneath the trees. No, we don't. Because we like the aesthetic of the, the olive trees growing out of the terrain. We cut them. Not all of them are harvested, but it's the way we like them. We don't add decorative plants around them. With local help, we start to prune our trees. We have to learn it. I still am learning it. And of course, we started to harvest the olives, which is always fun in the company of friends. Our biggest harvest amounted to almost 1,000 kilo. But I have to say, we hardly harvest more than a third of our trees, because not every tree is pruned well every year. And it's also <clears throat> our means of transport, which are limited. On the day of the harvest, we deliver the fruit to Olive Press, our choice. Sometimes we have to drive, drive two times, or we help, we ask friends to help us. And it's the Cooperativa Novo Cilento in San Novo Cilento. It's one hour drive, even so we have an oil mill in our town, but we prefer them. For example, <clears throat> it's them who are supplying the biological certified olive oil to a body shop. We use a trimmer to cut the meadows. As I said, the hay is fodder for donkeys. And we are not free yet of the eternally repetitive task of weeding. I am citing Olivier Philippi. He wrote it in his beautiful book where he encourages gardeners to embrace the idea of a garrigue garden. After trimming the olives, twigs are shredded and bigger branches put aside for firewood. But it doesn't mean <clears throat> that we can't do without bonfires. From time to time, we clear new areas of the garden from shrubbery. It's mostly pistachio lentiscus. And on this occasion, we discover old dry stone walls and already existing cistus plants benefit from the less competition of plants and they get more light. Three years later, we added more cystos, this were the original ones, they grew bigger. And the lentisk, we cut down to the roots. Now they re-sprouted and we shaped them. 
and pruning is Gundula's domain. This myrtle ball, for example, started as a very small shrub, kept small by the goats. And meanwhile, we should look out for a bigger ladder. The myrtle ball and the lentisk ball. And this is the Via Madonna di Loreto, this old road running in between the two pieces of land we own. This <clears throat> lentisk is shaped as a small multi-stem tree and stands at the side of our main border. On the other side, we have this pistachia thicket, which is cloud pruned, and we call it the brain. In parts where the stone walls are collapsed, I connect the terraces with simple steps. Sphere-shaped pistachia lentiscus, and a cubiform myrtle. We also planted some cypresses. This one takes a while to grow. It's already for at least six years in our garden. It's a very rocky ground where it stands. Jays bury acorns all over our ground. And without mowing our garden, we transform into an oak wood. Well, eventually it will in our elder age. Some of the small existing Quercus pubescens are also shaped and incorporated in our macchia planting. Here's one example, there's another one, and another one. Again, Pistacia lentiscus, but also Viburnum tinus, which also occurs naturally on our land. Well, <clears throat> we'd like to share some of our challenges. Above our property runs a provincial road, and therefore the upper part in some places became a garbage dump. We don't see from the garden, but we know it's there and haven't found a way yet to avoid this. Over the last year, the wild boar population has increased a lot, looking for insects or edible roots, bulbs, Gladiolus italicus, Arum italicum are among the favorites. They accidentally dig out some of our plants. And where there was a green meadow, now there's a plowed field. An electric fence reduces damage, but the wild boars always find ways to enter. So this is an ongoing process. On the slopes above our property, fire are often set in summer, it's arson, and the reasons are manifold. So, <clears throat> not the end of this dark note, I'd like to show you some more pictures from our garden. We very much enjoy having sunlight from early morning till evening. These beautiful sunsets. Spring with Judas trees in full bloom. They've been there already. The fresh leaves of the pomegranates from a beautiful contrast. Here they are. Same spot from higher up. Here you see the closing wall of our Hortus conclusus. In the midst are the old orange trees, tapestries trees in spring, and the path. To create this path and others, I made use of the many stones the wild boars dug up, and then I added some gravel. That was the first reason I built them, but then I must say it became quite a nice feature. Same border, the other direction. Sagas Claria settled in quite well and it's happily self seeding. And here you see the inflorescence of our Hiparina Hirta catching the light. The plain of Pestum is renowned for its artichoke fields. We prefer to buy the buds in the market and let ours flower. Pleorum fruticosum and an oleander. 
eu vou pleur um shrubby hairs here, flowers in the height of summer, and it's therefore a very valuable addition for our planting. This was another present from Don Lindsay. Our macchia planting was in summer with a huge Ampelodesmus mauritanica, which came on its own and chose a perfect spot. Some of our visitors <clears throat> do not recognize this is a garden and they don't, don't acknowledge the amount of work we put in. And certainly the local people foraging for wild oregano and asparagus in our absence consider this a natural macchia and therefore free to roam. Paradoxically, they compliment us for our efforts. A garden with gardeners, which in part is supposed to look as if no gardeners were involved. That's what we like to achieve. This is artwork from my sister. You can sit on them, they're made out of clay. And in winter, the foliage of the downy oaks take on this golden color. And if everything goes well, I'm going to see this picture on Saturday, because on Friday morning, early we're leaving, sleeping one night in Pompeii, and then we try to get to our place in daylight. And yes, it is a paradise for us. Thank you for being with me. Angela? Thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, would you unshare so we go and see everybody in the gallery now? Yes. Fantastic. Um, combination of nature and and garden but a lot of work I, I can see how much work there is there um, I'm sure we all can um, I thought it was a fantastic presentation I thought it was great that you started way out outside you you started with your walks on the mountains you looked at the combos that were going on in nature around you and said, that looks nice, let's do that inside. And I think that's some, it's such an easy, it's such a fundamental lesson that I think sometimes people in their hurry to read more books and so on, don't actually, you know, pay yeah. attention to, mm -hmm. um, myself included, I might add. Has anyone got any questions for uh, Peter? Uh, if you could put your hand up so I can see you at the top of the screen. I had one. Yes. I saw your, your irises um, beautifully interspersed with um, perennials and so on. How many, what, what's your optimum number? How many do you put them in, put them in, in, in clumps of, of how many would you recommend to achieve that sort of, you know, repeat repetitions well, when we buy them we put in in the beginning maybe two or three and then we wait to, to have more of them yeah but when we get them from friends who have already many of them like the barbata we put in 50 at once so okay so That's after good. two years we have we can double them and, and so on okay and how often do you do you dig them up and thin them Oh, we, it's only the two of us. Yeah. I think with the help of at least five gardeners, we could do more work. So in some years, we, we don't get to it. And yeah. even if we planned it, so it would be ideal to do it every three or four years, but we not often get to it. Um, okay, uh, Peter Wright. Oh, hello. Hi. Hello, Peter. Hello. Um, Please remind me of the name of the plant that you called the uh, the brain bush. Oh yeah, that is Pistacia lentiscus. It's one of the three pistachia species. There is Pistacia lentiscus, the ones you've seen. Mm -hmm. There is Terebinthus, both of them are Mediterranean shrubs. And then from Persia is the Pistacia vera, the one we eat as nuts. Okay. And That's it's effective because many gardeners <clears throat> well, or let's say it another way. Many gardens you can see in the Mediterranean area, they have 
bulb plants, I don't know from where they come, from America, from wherever, and they shape them, they cut them, and they would have perfect species in their nature. And in the nature, you can see them um, shaped by goats, by wild animals, and they would fit so well in their gardens. Okay, okay so that. I've got three people with their hands up. So let's start with Rosie. Rosie, who I can't see you, but you've got your hand up. I presume oh. you're saving bandwidth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a great presentation. Thank you, Peter. Um, can you just tell, uh, tell me more about the soil preparation when you're actually planting each plant? And how, uh, how often do you water, or if at all, after they're planted? Thank well, you. to start with the water, um, in theory, um, we plant in autumn and hope for a wet winter, which doesn't always come. And if the winter was dry and then we get back to the place in, in February and we start watering and try because we don't have time. So one year, if, if the plants don't make it, we, we plant other ones. And the ground preparation <clears throat> in part we started uh, to, to create borders where the walls collapse. So there are already stones there. And the soil is a mixture between a very rich soil, which is very deep, but a lot of stones too. And sometimes we add a little bit of gravel and a little bit of sand. So if you would plant in the middle of the ground, we couldn't use too many of the dry loving plants because the soil is too rich. Mm. Thank you. Um, Barbara, Paul, next. Okay. First of all, thank you, Peter. That was just fabulous. I love the fact that you, you're you um, obeying nature. And if things don't work, you leave them away and you put something in that does work. I love it. I think you said there was one of the irises that was good for shade. Do you remember which one that was? Um, this is Fertilissima. It's a natural plant. You can find it in all kinds of Mediterranean woodlands. Uh -huh. Here is Petitissima. It has a very elegant flower and the seeds are red, are very beautiful, like, like red pearls. It's a pleasure to have it. Okay, thank you very much. I'll look Welcome. at that. Um, Susan Brooks, hi. Hello, um, just a, a quick, part of my question was answered before because you said there was, you have a very, very rich soil, which uh, is quite interesting. Uh, do you mulch is my question. Um, we should, we should mulch more with, with stones, with gravel. Mm. It's an open discussion between me and Gondola. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Anyway, beautiful garden, absolutely beautiful. We, we mulch with organic material, only um, the, the orange trees and the roses. Okay, so you don't mulch the plants at all. No, no, you no. Have a, you have a very rich soil. Yeah, rich enough okay. for them, at least. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maggie Avance. Hi, Maggie. Could you just read the chat quickly for me, please, and see if there's anything on there? Hi, Angela. Yes, there have been several requests for a plant list um, mm -hmm. because people have been very impressed by the way you're using the wild plants and flowers, and it's the sort of thing that other people are trying to do. Um, so that's something to think about maybe. Um, there are lots of very, very positive comments about how beautiful the garden is, um, complimenty on the presentation, really inspiring, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's just dozens of those. Um, there's questions about the soil, which I think you've already just answered. Um, asking where the garden is on Instagram. Yes, it's called Giardino, the, the Italian word for garden, underscore D, the I, Italian for off, and another underscore Hera, H E R A. Okay, so hopefully people can find that. Yeah. Um, a question here about whether you've considered incorporating hugel culture for the pruning debris. Um, well, <clears throat> not living there all year round, mm. um, we don't have a vegetable garden. I mean, we plant some, some, some herbs, basilicum, when we get there, and 
we leave and it dries and we buy new ones. And <clears throat> we have a compost and we have kind of a Hügel garden where we, um, everything we, we, we don't burn or when we um, shred it, we put on a, on, a, on a place and then after a year, two, three, four, we, we, we take it and bring it to the roses and, and, and to the orange trees. But we don't build a Hügel um, grab um, for, for vegetables. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a, a query again about the rain. I think you told us at the very beginning. Yeah, um, but people might have yeah, not. Yeah. Uh, so the total that. amount is um, slightly more than 600 millimeters, which is, in theory, concentrated in the winter. But <clears throat> as everybody over these last years <clears throat> is aware of, climate really goes goes crazy. Mm -hmm. So this summer in August, we had heavy rains, which in the beginning was good for our olives, but it, then it kept on raining and it was still warm. So we had to fly. Mm -hmm. And there's no year like the other. So every year a new adventure. So there are no, no regularities anymore. Mm -hmm. Normally we'd expect more rain in the, winter half of the year and then it stops in, in, in April, May and it cannot rain for many, many, many weeks to come. That should be normality, but we're not sure we're still living in a normal world, climate-wise. Yes, Nobody it. knows. <laughs> um, I think that's all the actual sort of questions as it were. Um, there are just literally dozens of compliments, Peter. So um, thank you very much. I, I'll, I'll, I'll send Peter. I send Peter. Mm -hmm. I'll send you a copy of all of the chat so you can. Brilliant. Bar. Um, and, and presumably you'll 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 have a few, uh, well, many more and, followers on Instagram. Um, Connie, I'm going to take one more question. Connie Anderson. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, I want to add my thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask what. Could you remind me the plants that you put under the pomegranate trees? Oh, this was a lavandula angustifolia. It's a lavender, mm -hmm. which is native also to our areas, but it's a mountain plant in southern Italy. Thank you. Bene, okay. Um, I think that was a, 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 a most amazing presentation, really, truly one mm -hmm. of the most inspiring in the sense that you're in and out of the nature and I and and it and it, and it was also very real a real garden made by real people not lots of gardeners so our compliments I think um we would love to come and visit oh we, we and love Peter it. and I we Peter and I are, are yes. already in talking about that and um so for now um I just have to wish you all a happy Christmas. I am working on the 2023 cycle, um, but it's trying to fit people into months and until it's ready, I'm going to stay mute, um, getting everybody to shift around on each of the months. But I do intend to, to go forward, even though obviously we can now do so much more in person. Um, so let's, you know, we'll hope for 2023. Okay, um, and thank you all for supporting this um, for now the third year running. And if people are always asking me, are you recording them? And can we see them if we can't fit, you know, fit it in or we can't join the live? And this on every invite is the link to the YouTube channel, which has been set up by Yvonne Barton and we post all of the presenters. Um, and I think we're now up to something like 20, 22 different presentations. So please, yes, you can always catch up. And um, that's good. Um, so thank you again, Peter. Fantastic. Thank Come you, Andrew. Lovely, lovely. Also in the name of Gundula. And really, and you did us a Gundula big, big also. favor to include us. And yeah. we'd be very happy to see you. Okay. And we don't have a plant list, but um, I take the point. We, we could prepare one and send it to you. So you. Okay. That's, well, that's if, that, if you would be very kind, then I will. Mm. I will send that to the participants mm. of this presentation. 
And I've, I've taken the point on the chat from somebody who says um, that actually I will ask speakers in the future to prepare that also perhaps in advance if they, if they can, mm -hmm. um, so that we can have one every, every, on every month, okay? Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Peter. Lots of love. Yes. Lots of love to Thank you, Peter. And everybody. Thank you, Angela. Bye, Peter. Thank you again. Thank fantastic. you, Angela. Grazie mille. Fantastico. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.